Sorry. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. Um, uh, first item are uh, apologies. Um, I've received apologies from uh, Councillor Michelle Cook, Councillor Ben Price, and I think Councillor Sarah Manuels has, has submitted apologies as well. Other than that, I think we're a full full house. Any other apologies from anybody? Excellent. Uh, item two are the minutes of the meeting of the 24th of March. Um, can we have a mover? Uh, thank you, Richard. And a seconder, John. Thank you very much. Uh, all those in uh, favour? Excellent. Thank you. They're moved. Um, item three are declarations of interest. Um, I have none to declare. Does does anybody else? No. Excellent. Item four is uh, update from me. Um, the only uh, item I've got is that there will be um, an additional meeting, which is scheduled for the twenty third of August. Um, this is to um, get the local plan review in um, prior to it going through uh, cabinet process. Uh, and it was just felt that uh, to give us opportunity on, on, on scrutiny to look at it, we, we needed an extra meeting. So that's, that's, that's the only thing of note I've, I've got. So item five, our responses to reports of the Infrastructure Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee. There's nothing expected uh, from that. Um, item six, our consideration of matters referred to Infrastructure Safety and Growth from Cabinet and Council, and there's no new items that I'm aware of. So uh, we'll move on to item seven, which is the dry recycling contract update. So I'm going to hand over to, uh, well, I'll just give a little bit of a briefing that we've, this is something that we, we agreed to look at on a, on a sort of quarterly basis. And that was back maybe 12 months ago, actually. Um, so we, we've, we've had a number of, number of updates um, and tonight we have another one. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Councillor Doyle um, to, to inf introduce if that's, if that's okay. And we've got obviously Andrew Barrett, um, Ben Percival and Nigel Harris from the, from the Joint uh, Waste Service. So Steve. I think after that introduction, there's not a fat lot for me to say, is there? Um, so you've been presented with some figures and uh, some information. Um, the main stakeholders are, in, are here with us now, so if there's any questions you want to ask, thank you. Thanks, Steve. I don't know, Andre, if you want to just uh, do, do any introduction. Yeah, I think perhaps just like to invite um, either Ben or Nigel just to take us, take members through the briefing note. Um, expand on areas that uh, that need be, and then um, perhaps take any questions arising from the committee, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yes. So, uh, so Ben or uh, Nigel. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, yeah, as as you say, this has been a an item that's come to scrutiny regularly over the last twelve months, and this is the first briefing post the implementation of the new service. So, the implementation commenced on the 2nd of May and the, the implementation completed on the 30th of May. So it was a month long implementation. And it's fair to say during that month of May, we had a number of challenges. It was a, a very complicated, a uh, lot of moving parts, transitional phase. We had to deliver the bags, we had to deliver the bins. We had to put new rounds on because critically collecting the bins and the bins and bags is slower than just collecting a bin. So we've had to change all the rounds, uh, and we we ran dual stream collections, the bin and the bag, alongside the co-mingled collections, which is just the bin for the month of May as we rolled out the the bags. Um, and as a result, as I'm sure you're aware, we had a number of issues throughout May, and you can see on Appendix 1 the, the, um, the completion rates, and particularly noticeable through the month of May, we had regular days where we weren't able to complete rounds. Um, in terms of Tamworth, there was only one day in which our collection rate dropped below 98%. 
and every day we were able to collect the missed bins the following day. So whilst you know it, it's important that we apologise to residents for the disruption, we were able to catch up the following day on every occasion, and we, we and on only one occasion did we miss more than two percent of bins. Um, in terms of the initial performance, and it's important to state that this week now is is, is week six of the of the service, the full service. Um, so it's very early to draw any conclusions or make any recommendations, but looking at the initial data that is presented in Appendix 2, and you've only got the first four weeks there, but certainly the, those figures have been mirrored in Week 5 and in Week 6. Uh, broadly speaking, there's nothing there to frighten us. The, the, there's no alarm bells being rung. Key things to highlight are there's no appreciable increase in residual waste. So certainly one of the concerns we had is that if people were struggling with the dual stream system, they might be putting what would be previously gone into the recycling bin into their general waste bin. There's no evidence from the tonnages that we're collecting that that's happening. Uh, the missed bin reports are steadily improving. So again, we're getting better at collecting all the bins. And critically, since the, since, the, uh, since the 30th of May, when we went on to dual stream collections fully, We've only, we've only had one day where we've had a, a problem with collections, and that was the day there was the lorry fire on the A5, and we just couldn't get to and from the tip in time. Other than that, we've had five weeks of unbroken 100% collections, which we, you know, uh, is really positive. And the other thing that we've, we've, we've made real improvements on is the number of bins we've had to reject, and that's thanks to the cooperation and support of our residents. So I, as you'll see, week one, we, we had to reject more than 1,000 bins, whereas now, as I put on the end of this report, um, the, the compliance with the system is, is, was 97%. Last week, it was 99%. So we, had, we were rejecting only 1% of bins. So the support and compliance from our residents has been absolutely fantastic. They've really embraced this. And where we have got... Um, residents that are con continuing to struggle to engage in the new system we're sending our recycling officers out to educate and support um, so really the, the key messages for me are we had a few issues when we were implementing in may, in may. we're through that now uh, the the services record of consistent and reliable service delivery has been re-established from the beginning of june uh, and as i say the the data that we've got so far it's early to make, make any recommendations and make changes, but looking at the data, it's encouraging. What we're intending to do, because this is, this is new to us in the same way as it's new to residents, is we are going to do reviews, certainly at month three and month six, to see if there are ways that we can tweak. We're constantly tweaking the performance, but to see if there's a different way of doing things, uh, see if there's ways of improving this but it's probably a bit early to make a, 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 any sort of data-led informed decisions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of, um, couple of questions, comments. Um, I think, I think the 98% the collection rate is, is, is quite, quite good, actually. I think that's, that, it feels quite good. Um, um, and I just wondered also the um, the the sort of recycling collection of figures on t in the appendix two table. How do they sort of compare, or do we know how they compare with, say, an, a, another authority's rollout of of a dual streaming? Probably don't have those figures, but. I, I have to be careful here, obviously. Um, what, I, what it is important to, stress, to say is, and I should have said in, in my introduction, that this has absolutely transformed the quality of the recycling that we're collecting. So pre this, when we were doing commingled waste, our contamination rate rates, the, number, the amount of non-recycler that was founding its way into the recycling stream was around 14, 15%. Currently, the, the, the contamination for paper and card is less than 2%, and glass cans and plastics is less than 5%. So the, 
So since we've moved to dual stream, we've not had a single load rejected from, from BIFA who collect our waste. I, I'm aware that other authorities have had rejected loads. Um, so it's, it's extremely positive. And again, one, once we've got the data from BIFA, we can start adding that to the data that we present here, saying what our, our, our contamination rates are. But at the moment, we know that it's below 2% for paper and card and below 5 for glass cans and plastics. Can I add that? Sorry, can I just add that we've been congratulated by Biffa, who owned the Murph. The quality has been transformed, and we've been down a couple of times to see it. And, you know, it's some of the best paper and card I've seen. So again, a big thank you to the residents for um, participating in the scheme in the way we wanted them to. Uh, thank you, Nigel. Stay, Steve. I just wanted to add. I've been charting the figures as they come in on a daily basis, and. Initially, we were doing around about 10 metric tons of paper and card when we first started. Now it's up to 20 plus. So it's going in the right direction. Even organic has increased as well. Thank you. Yeah, that, that sounds very encouraging, actually. So that's, that's, that's pleasing to hear. Uh, questions and comments from anybody else? Hello, yeah. Um, I'm afraid, well, my very first um, experience of the new, the new system was on the very first day. Um, I have actually mentioned this before, but um, I had a phone call from a lady who was um, not in my particular ward, but she couldn't get hold of her, her ward councillors. She told me uh, that she'd just been ringing around councillors and, and I was one that she, she recognised. She tried, her bin had not been taken, a big blue bin had not been taken. Um, she was an elderly lady in her mid-80s. Her husband was bedridden upstairs, leukemia. Um, she was crying her eyes out because they've left my bin. Uh, so I tried to reassure her and she came from Riverside. So I went round to Riverside to see what she was, uh, see what the problem, see if I could help. Looked into the bin, and the reason that it hadn't been taken, apparently the uh, the sticker was on the on the bin or the, the tag telling her to call this number that she couldn't get anyone from. And um, she'd done it beautifully, apart from a cake box, which was a cardboard cake box with a plastic uh, top on it. She'd put that in the plastic, thinking that that was a plastic thing. And presumably the, uh, the guy who was collecting it looked at it for cardboard, and left it. I was under the impression that we were going to give people a bit of a bedding in period, two or three weeks to uh, not be so uh, strict. Uh, because this, I ended up, I'd got some bags in my car, I ended up emptying her bag into bags and then I took it away. I, I, I managed the Masonic rooms, took this couple of bin bags away with me, put them in the, um, in the, uh, the bin at, at the club, and it was taken away by Bryce. So that was one lot that we didn't have to deal with. Um, I wasn't terribly impressed by that because I thought we'd got this cushion and for people to actually get used to what is and what isn't um, acceptable. So um, that's just something I wanted you to, to be aware of. I'm, I'm sure that nothing you can say on that. It was just some overly efficient operator. Uh, the main problems I've had and the main feedback I've had since the, uh, the, the, the scheme was introduced is namely the bags are far too small. And the main issue that I found was one that I'd actually brought up at a, a meeting long before it was actually introduced. And I'd asked the question, are these bags, can you connect them to the bins? Can you hook them? over the bin handles so that they are not going to be just sitting on the floor flying around when there's a bit of wind. And I was assured they were, that they were capable of being clipped onto the, uh, the bins, which of course they're not. So that was incorrect information. Again, I was very disappointed when I received the, uh, the blue bag. My wife, uh, who is uh, an assiduous 
um, collector and splits it all beautifully. She's um, she's very into all that sort of thing. And she was uh, very, very unhappy about it. And subsequently, others have been too. Um, I'm sure you've had a lot of feedback on that. Um, I don't know if you can respond to any of those points. Thanks. Yeah, in, in terms of the bag, the bag was specified so that it would fit in the top of the bin. That's why if you look at other authorities, they tend to have taller and thinner bags. So locally, Newcastle and Stafford have taller and thinner bags. We had a, a, a shorter, fatter bag, particularly so that residents could fit it in into the top of the bin. It was never designed to be hooked onto the bin. So I, I'm sorry in terms of that information was incorrect that you were provided with, but it was designed to fit in the top of the bin. Um, what we have been doing is we have been providing residents with second bags if they've, if they've requested them, uh, because yeah, we, we do acknowledge capacity is an issue for some residents. The vast majority of residents are managing perfectly well with one, um, and as I say, we've, we've got 99% compliance now with the new service. Um, so residents are managing by and large, but absolutely, it's one of the one of the difficulties with a service that covers eighty thousand households. We we need to provide a standard service because that's how we're able to do a a quick collection and finish every day. But one size doesn't fit all. So you know, while while a bag may may suit most, it won't suit everybody. So people people might need need a second bag. I, I mentioned earlier what we're looking at potentially is, is reviews at three and six months. It might be that some residents have been provided with a purple bin instead of a instead of a bag, uh, and that's worked very well for them. It may be that we look at rolling out more bins, uh, but again, these are the these are some of the things that we need to do in terms of um, the uh, understanding the data once we have a, a a sufficient mass of the data. In terms of the lady who who had her bin. Rejected. I'm, I'm very sorry for this, the distress that will have been caused to that lady. Again, one of the things that we've learned from this is in terms of communication, we said there'd be an amnesty period. What we meant with an amnesty period is we'd go back and collect it once the bin had, once the contamination had been taken out of the bin. Because our, the, the amount of contamination we're allowed to put in the bins is much lower on this contract, we, we simply can't have the, the, the operatives turn, turning a blind eye to, to bins they know to be contaminated. But again, it's a learning experience for them. And we have been talking to, to our crews to say, yes, you know, it's great that you are seeing the contamination, but please try and be, be, be practical about this. If it's only one thing, fish it out. So again, it's a, it's a learning experience for us, but yes, very sorry for the experience that lady had. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Um, if I could just follow on from that. Well, thank you. I wanted, uh, with regards to the, the purple bin, um, there is um, uh, one resident I know of who's refused point blank to use the uh, the bags. And he's, in actual fact, I think he put the bag in the in the bin, so it's been uh, discarded, recycled. recycled yeah. Um, and he said that he wants a purple bin and if he gets a purple bin he will recycle but won't do it until he gets one will he be able to apply for a purple bin if he's got the space and the facilities to put it there thanks the the, the, the slightly ambiguous answer is not now uh, the the issue is we, we we can't do sort of bag at one house, bin at the next house, bag at one house, bin at the next house. They're collected by different vehicles. So the vehicle that collects the the purple bins is a different vehicle to the one that collects the blue bin and the blue bag. So at this stage, no, he can't. But one of the things we will consider going forward is is there an opportunity to put more residents onto bins if it suits them, if it suits the geography, if it suits the, the nature of the houses on the rounds, but it would have to be done on a round by round basis at the moment. So the, the, the short answer is no, the, the longer answer is not now. Thanks Ben. Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, how many requests for second or additional bags have been made as of yet, if you have those figures? The last time I looked, three and a half thousand. 
we just had, we've got about 16,000 spare bags at the moment, so we've got plenty of capacity there. Shuri. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm new to the committee, so apologies if anything I ask um, has already been answered at previous meetings. I'd like to ask about the bags. Um, I was given to understand by, I, don't, I can't remember the source, that the bags were not as per specification. So the bags that you got were not what you wanted. Um, so I'd like a bit more information on that as to whether that's true or not. Um, and if so, why? And what's been done about it? If that's not true, okay, fine. Um, I, I'm a little bit concerned about the way the system operates because at the moment we've got nice weather on the whole. I mean, obviously it's Britain, so it does rain, but um, on the whole it's relatively nice weather, so we haven't got bags of soggy paper and cardboard sitting around. But I am concerned, and I know residents are concerned, about what's going to happen when the weather's not so nice. I've also had residents who've said to me, we don't understand why it's this way around because bags full of paper and card are heavy and a bag full of plastic and um, tins and so on would be less heavy. So why don't we have the bin for the paper and the bag for the plastic if we've got to do it that way? Um, and I, ca I can sort of sympathise with that because once that bag is full, it will be heavy. And of course, if it gets wet, it'll be unliftable. So quite a few things there, Chair, but I wonder if, if you could comment on any of those. Thank you. If I can just come in as well for first. Um, I'd like to sort of try and focus on us moving forward rather than, than looking back a little bit. And I, I know, Sheree, you've not, you're have not you new on this committee, but it has been, the process has been followed through and scrutinised over the, over the last 12 months, really. So some of those, some of those concerns and questions probably refer back to um, obviously that pre-implementation stage as opposed to, to afterwards. But just a, just a comment. I do appreciate that, Chair, but having said that, I and I'm sure other councillors are getting questions from residents, so I'd like to be able to answer those questions. Uh, ben Nigel. In, in terms of the bags and their compliance, this is something that we're discussing right now with the the supplier so if it's all right with the committee it's probably appropriate that we give an update on that at the next committee um, it's a matter it's a live matter that's being discussed right now um, in terms of the the use of the the bags for glass cans and plastics instead it is something that has been has been raised because particularly with you know new ways of living and more amazon more deliveries paper and card is increasing uh, there are a number of issues with putting glass cans and plastics in the bag, particularly for households that produce a lot of glass. It is the heavier of the two commodities. Uh, it's not as safe putting glass that is prone to breakage in a, in a, in a, in a woven uh, polypropylene bag. Um, but uh, notwithstanding that, it is something that we are looking at in terms of how we provide householders with additional capacity for the paper and card. Because we are looking at um, whether we have got this the right way around. And broadly speaking, we have, because the, the vehicles, that, and, and there's a danger that I become a complete bin boy here and go down a rabbit hole, so somebody signal if I don't. But broadly speaking, the, the, the vehicles that collect the, the bin and the bag, they're split a third, two thirds. The paper and card goes in the the third side, and the glass cans and plastics goes in the in the in the two thirds side. It's the it is the right way round. It's not a perfect ratio. There's more than a third card, but less than half. So it is the right way round. But it it, it is so we have got it the right way round. But it's not a perfect split. But certainly in terms of you, your your comments around the the volume and the amount of paper and card that we're getting, you, you're absolutely right, and it is something that we'll need to consider as this evolves. With regard to how this will work through the winter, we'll have to wait and see. This this is sort of the the recycling um, system is different throughout the country, but uh, a bag and a bin is as close as we've got to the industry standard for recycling and it does work in other authorities it works in stafford it works in, in in newcastle the bags have got the velcro lids um it's not the case that we can't take 
wet paper and card. It's when it gets so wet that it, it, it can't be picked up, and particularly the sideways just falls all over the all over the, the pavements. Uh, but it's something that we're looking at, and particularly as we come to Christmas, where we know people have got a lot more paper and card. How do we provide additional capacity over the Christmas period? So yeah, it's sort of it's a little bit really good and, and valid observations, and ones that we've heard from a number of residents. Uh, but it's it's part of our of our learning journey. Could I just add, Chair, that um, we did visit Newcastle in the winter, and also during some inclement weather. And what residents were being encouraged to do there was to put the, the bag within the bin. And the way we've procured the bag, it does fit into the bin and still allows space down the uh, either side of the bag for people to put the glass cans and plastic. So there was a lot of presentation of the bags within the bin when we visited. So they will minimise the risk of obviously litter and, uh, and other factors. So, And it seemed to work pretty well there when we visited. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, um, I mean, if I can, if I just say that I think at the uh, not not last full council meeting, because that was that was last night, but the previous one, I think it was agreed that there was a there was going to be um, a review uh, on the implementation phase, and and I guess if I can just ask Andrew what what the the schedule for that is, um, that that might help committee with with questions, perhaps when that's been completed. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, at say, the, the last normal full council, um, the Leader announced that there was to be a, a, a sort of a, an independent review into implementation and, and review of service um, jointly um, across both authorities. That work has been commissioned. Um, it's likely it will be concluded probably in early August, I think, um, with its initial findings. That will go to um, um, Leaders and, Chief and um, Portfolio Holders for for review and i would suggest if the time scale fits we'll bring that forward as part of the uh, the next update to this committee thank you andrew yeah i think that i think that would help and i think that might sort of um cover some some of the perhaps concerns that the committee might might have uh... yeah good evening everybody um just a couple of things really what is the life Span of the bags in your estimate. Truthfully, I don't think we know. We, as part of the the options appraisal, we did uh, budget for uh, replacing. It was ten percent every year. Ten percent every year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, I've got a couple of um, well older residents, and my mother-in-law as well. She's eighty-four. And she can't pick the bag up because of her arthritis and whatever, and get it to the actual roadside. What facilities are we offering to, to do that? Is, I know I wrote down that you've got a recycling officer, but that I, I'm not seeing any communications to help or advise people to ring this number. We, we do have an assisted collection scheme. So for residents who are struggling to, to bring their bag their bins to the curbside mm -hmm. and we'll collect them from from the curtilage of the house uh, that's a system that we've always had in place for the bins okay. and something that we we will expand for the bags we've got around 2,000 residents already re already registered on that scheme and I, I did put it in the briefing note we have had a modest increase in that which mm -hmm. we anticipated because exactly as you said for, for residents who are able to wheel a bin they won't be necessarily yeah, you know, they to, be in a wheelchair to, or... to, to carry yeah. a bag so yeah, what we, we, we are anticipating an increase in that scheme, and that's what we've we, we've noticed. It's a, it's, a, it's a modest increase. It's around about two hundred okay. to around about ten percent. Is the scheme information on the website or what it is? It? Yes. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, just bring Andrew in. I think he has comment. Yeah, it's just a, a probably personal experience on how long do the bags last. Um, I, I live in Stafford, and um, we've had our bags for about three and a half years. Mine's still going strong. Okay. And I'm a, I'm a reasonably competent recycler. So um, they're made out of similar material. So I think you know it's, uh, it's it's probably better than we anticipated. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Um, the final Sandra. question, which is you probably just touched on, actually, what are our plans for the Christmas period when it is, does obviously peak? Um, you know, will there be additional collections to to move the mass, or over the Christmas period, what, what are your plans? Yes, thank you. Yes, we've already started to plan for Christmas. Likely to have to put some extra resource on 
Um, we may collect the card and paper separately in a different vehicle. We haven't decided yet. We, or we might make um, each round slightly smaller and put some more infrastructure on. Obviously, it depends on getting staff, etc., and vehicles, but we're already in the planning stage for that. So we know Christmas is coming, and um, every, every year is a sort of 30%, 40% increase in volume. So um, we won't let the residents down. We'll have some very worked-up plans. Th thanks, Nigel. Andrew? Yeah, I think it's just worth saying it. Christmas is planned for every year. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it is a it's it's always a really heavy period yeah. of, um, of waste collection because yeah. people at home extra waste you know, and that sort of thing so it's it is always a difficult time it's always one that gets planned well in advance to, uh, to do so i think probably the reassurance is whilst it might be a slightly different collection methodology this year it's no different than normal but will I that think be communicated to the residents it, it always is okay. it always is it could probably mean that day changes may happen or stuff like it's that depends when christmas like falls year, it's just one day change. Yeah. yeah i think it's it yeah uh, Andrew, I think I think if perhaps we could get an update on that at our next briefing, that might be quite useful. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um, in the report, you say that the pressure on the service was exacerbated by a number of other factors. Two drivers resigned at the start of the rollout. The scarcity of HGV drivers is a national challenge. Both drivers have subsequently returned. However, how much of a future risk is that to the uh, collection? Um, and what are we doing uh, about it to mitigate that risk? You're right to highlight it. It, it, is, a, it is an ongoing risk. It's probably the... Uh, the most critical risk in terms of service failure. Um, we, we know that there's a, a national shortage of HGV Class C drivers. Um, pleased to say that whilst uh, we, we're, we've inducted three recently, so we've got three coming into the workforce. The other thing we are, we've, we've also modestly increased the, the driver pay. So we've, we've accelerated them all to the top of their scale, which will help us retain those staff um, it's not going to make a massive difference. We anticipate in terms of recruitment, but in terms of retention of staff, that will make a big difference, we believe. The other thing we are exploring doing is training our own drivers and then committing them to a training agreement. So if we invest in their training, they stay with us for a set period of time. So that's something that we, we are doing, but you, you're absolutely right to highlight it is a, a critical risk, and those are some of the things that we're doing to try and address it. Thanks, Ben. Um, any other questions or comments? Richard. Uh, thank you. Uh, during the time where we were discussing implementing this, we had, I believe there was a brief discussion about the people who have not yet moved on to it, who, live, who have communal bins, uh, and just the single bin, what well, I'm one of them myself, uh, single recycling bin. Uh, is there any plans, or have the plans progressed to implement it for those who do are currently using communal bins? Yes, thank you for that. Um, yes, so we've got three and a half thousand properties that use communal facilities across both districts. All of those properties have got to be visited, assessed, um, communication with the residents. It's probably a piece of work that's going to take us about 12 months to complete. But um, now we've settled the service down and we're back to, to normality. It will be starting very shortly. So um, we'll be visiting you anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or, or comments? Nothing? Okay. Um, then I thank um, everybody for, uh, for attending. I think that's been very, very useful. We don't have any specific rec recommendations. It is just a, an update. But I think if you could uh, uh, consider the, um, perhaps some of the, the questions and comments for, for, for next time, I think that would be, that would be really useful. And, uh, We'll perhaps see you see you back in uh, in uh, in another three months time ish. So, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, next item item eight is uh, an electric vehicle charging update from uh, Matt Fletcher. Um, just as a bit of background for, for committee, this is this is something that that I've been well, I guess I've 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 been pestering pestering uh, 
for, 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 for what seems like in a number of years. Um, so, so quite close to my heart, I suppose. Um, and there's been a bit of a journey, but uh, Matt is going to give us an update on where we are at the moment. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Matt. Thank you. So um, following on from the last um, committee that we attended, we were unable at that time to give any financial details um, about the um, agreement that we'd entered into. So I thought, if that's OK, I'll just give a quick update on what that was, because obviously that agreement has been signed. So. Um, since getting approval um, to go ahead, um, the council has signed an agreement with BP Pulse, who are one of the um, largest growing suppliers. Um, and um, that was, uh, as detailed at other scrutinies, um, and um, I understand through Cabinet, um, that um, option was taken after a full options analysis and appraisal with the market because um, BP cover all costs. So there is absolutely no cost to the council of this service. They do all of the work, um, including all of the uh, power connectivity and supply all of the machines, then operate that. Um, and the reason that was taken uh, for members who weren't um, involved in those committees at the time was that um, when we were looking at it, it was still a relatively um, unknown and untested in Tamworth. So demand and then the ongoing maintenance of that um, this was seen as a real benefit that effectively it could be tried with a high profile um, high quality product. So um, since the um, last um, scrutiny committee, all of the relevant um, legals have been done and we've entered into an agreement with BP Pulse. BP Pulse have since um, all the work at the time was just done desktop. They've since come out on site and they've engaged with the um, the um, it's DNO um, district network operator, which is Western Power. Um, so that has taken considerable time, more time than we'd expected for them to get back on. Um, and um, they've, we've now gone back and forth with them and we've highlighted the exact locations um, for the um, charges. So just to go into actual detail, um, there will be at this moment in time, two charges on each um, car park. They are fast charges and that's purposely designed to ensure, um, you know, that, um, you know, there's a turnover within our car parks. Um, each charger will have two charging points, so effectively there'll be four in each. And if members would like um, just a map of where the locations are, I can show them. I've printed off documents, if that helps. I think that probably would be helpful. So um, in con consultation, and I think we discussed this again, but I'll just um, go over it in consultation with members. Um, <clears throat> the um, two car parks that were also identified with BP Pools, because obviously they're doing this, um, you know, from, from their own market making point of view, um, was Riverside and Bulbridge. And they are obviously our, um, our two sort of key car parks. So if you look at Riverside first, the intention there is um, to place the chargers within the spaces nearest to the tennis courts. And that's um, both for visibility, disabled access and security points of view. Um, it's also quite easily seen um, when you access the car park because you, the flow is towards that and then round. So um, there is also the opportunity to extend their um, subject to be people's being very successful. If they are successful in the future, there's opportunity to extend. And then on the rear, um, there's Bulbridge, which is the cinema car park. Again, um, currently that's the highest uh, turnover car park in terms of income. There were two options that were explored. A, um, which is near the exit onto uh, onto the egg and B, the entrance. And uh, in conjunction with council officers, um, it was felt that B was the best uh, position there because um, again, visibility, but also high profile off that road. So um, currently um, we're waiting to hear back from BP Pulse. They've confirmed that um, they've got all of the information they need. They need to just get approvals at their end now that they understand the costs of installation. As you'll be aware, they have to have um, 
a certain connection um, certain power output in the areas that they do so um we we appreciate it's not quite as fast as we would have liked as well we we'd had hoped this to be a bit quicker and we are chasing them and we hope to have an answer very soon um just for members purposes there is um to note that uh, even if we get the go ahead at the moment currently because of the um, summer activities the river drive car park is out of bounds um from tonight until um i think it's the 20th of august so um, even if B Peoples came back tomorrow, we'd be able to do that um, until September. So um, we're hoping um, we're in regular contact with B Peoples. They are doing a lot of these at the moment. Um, but, um, you know, we, we hope it's disappointing that I'm unable to give you a date tonight. However, um, we're hopeful that that will be ratified quickly because we now know that everything has been resolved their end and all the queries have been sorted. So, um, you know, I hope to be able to report back very soon that we've got a, a date. So I hope that answers um, any questions. Chair. Th thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, that's that's really encouraging. I'm, 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 I feel we, we are now making some, some progress. Um, in more recent times, let's say, than we have done in the past. But um, a, a quick question, and I, I guess it's probably self-explanatory. But how how will we monitor the usage? I guess that's all inbuilt within the within the machines. That's correct. The um, I, I just from memory, um, the um, the agreement that we've had has certain stipulations on information um, that we can access. I'd have to go and check that for you just to refresh myself with the agreement because it has been a while since I've seen it. But um, from memory, yeah, there is a, um, a data sharing agreement within that. Um, yeah, within, within that. And we'll be able to compare that against the new software we've got um, for um, the new software available for car parking would allow us to correlate information as well. Yeah, I think I think that'd be, that's quite useful. I'm quite keen to see how that pans out actually because it will uh, really sort of tell us where where the usage is so uh, i think that i think that's a good thing um questions or comments from anybody else john thank you hello matt um it's just i'm, I'm sure this has probably been mentioned before just for my own uh, uh mind if you could tell me how what does installation of these uh, points take is there an awful lot of digging a laying of cables and how long does it take to actually establish one of these these points so um it, it's site dependent so each site um is looked at independently it will uh, be based about its proximity to a um a power supply so um how i um it, you're sorry that's what I was after. Thank you, Councillor Turner. Um, proximity to the substation and the power within the local network. So each site, that's why they have to go into detail. Each site um, is very different. So there are some car parts that were ruled out because there wasn't um, adequate car, um, power supply near or that could be found. So um, these car parks have have that. Um, the, um, the locations, again, have been chosen by, I understand by BP Pulse, so they minimise the amount of um, digging, but there will, of course, be an element of that. There might even be, um, in some cases, I'm waiting to hear about whether you know a further substation is needed at their cost. Um, I don't think that's the case for these based on the locations, and, and I, I think, like I said, they've been chosen based on their proximity to substations. Um, but yeah, there is always an element of, um, of works to them. Um, it will just depend on each one. Um, as we're not sort of, um, you know, investing in that ourselves, BP or that, the sort of information we might get off them might be limited on that. However, we will know, you know, if there's any disturbance to the wider car park. Again, if you look on both maps, they've chosen them next to green space. So um, that can be easily put back rather than, um, you know, tarmac or anything like that that um, is, is a bit more troublesome to uh, lay. I hope that helps. That's my knowledge of it. That's the best I can offer, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, any other? Sure. Just a brief comment. Delighted to see this. Delighted that we're making progress. I think it's something that we, we really need to do. So, thank you. Well done. Paul. Yeah, it's great. 
to, to see that we're, you know, finally catching up. But I'd, I'd like to ask, what is the future proofing of this? Because it's no doubt that electric cars is the way forward and everybody seems to be buying them and the demand's going up and legal requirements are going up. Uh, and we've only got four out of, you know, a town this size. And the biggest problem I see is the power supply, not just there, but if, they, if all of a sudden they say, well, we need 10 or 20 or 30, are we going to put the power cables in now to, to build it in? Or are we just going to put, you know, the facility for four and then hope? So, yeah, I th well, I think, there's, I think there's two sides to this. I think, so from, you know, um, there's, so fr from our perspective, we've looked at it at the moment. So in terms of your question around future proofing, totally totally agree and i think there's a wider question there around general infrastructure and i think certainly you know western power in any discussions we've had them with the council from a regeneration perspective you know are, are, are quite um you know vocal now in their need for new foot substations so i think i think there's a wider question that i can't answer there around you know that from our perspective you know the, the bp pulse represents a good opportunity now to to test it to establish a market and then potentially roll out further i think you know conversations that have been had around further regeneration schemes around um you know um, potential future changes you know short term and medium term around car parks um, you know, will have infrastructure into them, you know, and I, and I think, um, yeah, but, but I think it's a growing question and I think um, Anna can um, add more around on the strategy side that might, you know, might help you from that perspective. Thanks, Anna. Go for it. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, just to say that there is a corporate project in the corporate plan, which is we've just refreshed, so for the next three years, around an EV charging strategy that, that sits with myself and possibly Matt. Um, <laughs> um, so we do have to do an EV charging strategy, and we need to know what, as an authority, that means to us. We need to articulate what we want from such a strategy. And I think it's all very well responding to the odd regeneration opportunity or putting it on our land in our car parks, for example. I think they're, they're, they're obvious ways in which we can deliver, but there might be something more comprehensive or substantial that we might want to do. So we might want to look at our open spaces or, or our parks, our gardens. You know, it, it's, it's a much bigger conversation that we need to have as an authority to articulate that strategy. Then, then we can look at how we might want to deliver it and who the best organisational company is that we can work with to do that. And that's when you might get your future proofing, because if we can go to someone and say, actually, as an authority, we want X charging points in this sort of broad location, they might then uh, upscale their, their sort of networks to sort of uh, to help accommodate the ambition that we have. So until we, I think, can actually express what it is that we might want to see as an authority, I think it's quite hard to sort of no, reflect it from the other side. Yeah. So uh, is that a piece of work that we're the EV charging strategy is, is a corporate project that needs to be delivered um, and it's an important one. I know that there's there's a lot of ambition from members to have more EV charging points within within the borough for good reasons, and not necessarily just town centre. No, yeah. Neighbours, they've just had one put in the road. They actually dig the road up because there was not enough power to that house. Yeah. And you know, so I watched them for one car, three vans, electric diggers, dig it up, come back, put pipes in, more cables. Then fill it back up the next day again with all diesel generators and then to, the, to that one house and i thought well surely there's 25 houses in my street why didn't anybody knock on the door and say are you thinking about this in the future and shall we do all the houses and the best of it is she sold the car after six weeks saying i keep having anxiety for, so it's but I'm give it, oh. i think that's the, yeah i mean there's a different conversation completely there but uh I, Anna, do you want to come back in? And I know Steve wants to make a comment as well. Um, just to say that um, I sit on a, a senior sustainability, sustainability officers group, which is uh, Staffordshire wide. And we, we met today, we meet every month to look at opportunities across districts and boroughs because we've all got the same issues. So we don't necessarily have to deliver 
certain strategies in isolation when we're all trying to achieve the same thing. So today we actually had, as it happens, a conversation about EV strategy. So I am aware as a result of today's conversation that the uh, County Council have drafted a strategy. It's not quite ready for circulation, so I, I can't promise to deliver anything or, or comment on it, but I know that, the ha that one has been done. And that's key because a lot of um, charging is a sort of a, a highways issue. Um, um, not everyone has a, a driveway to park their car and charge a vehicle and people live in flatted or apartmented accommodation where you haven't got necessarily access um, to an EV charging point really quickly. So I think the county council have quite a large role to play in any strategy that comes forward because of that highways connection. Um, but then I was also talking um, with colleagues at South Staffordshire Authority who have written a draft EV strategy looking at charging on their own land um, sort of comprehensively across a network of villages and towns that they have. It's a bit different, it's more, um, more of a rural area. But again, they were looking at opportunities to work more collaboratively. So I think the conversations are starting to be held um, uh, on a level that's not necessarily Tamworth specific. Um, but I think there's a lot to learn from others. Um, and I think that's something that will develop, you know, over the next year or two. But, okay. Thank, thanks, Anna. And that, you, your final comments have probably just sort of answered the question I was going to ask, actually, on, on timescales. But uh, Steve? Just one comment. Um, well, actually, two. It's, I sit on uh, the Sustainability Board mm -hmm. as well. And... Um, it's a recognised discussion there that what we are making judgments on today will not be tomorrow's technology. In five years, things will change considerably. We face a number of issues, not just as Tamworth, but as a country, on how we generate and supply electricity. And that's a much wider discussion. Uh, I, mean, I can see solar panels becoming a lot more popular and a lot more efficient. Um, as a um, employee in the car sector what you're seeing that what when the models were originally launched you were looking at around about 200 miles out of a battery now that's now gone up to 400 in a couple of years time that could double again and then triple so the idea of pro, uh, and also the way that you charge the vehicle it may not be through better solar panels and that that you don't need to put extra cable in it. You're able to generate the electricity that powers your own car. The mm. cars are going to get lighter and more efficient at what they do. So all this is coming and there's a lot of changes ahead. Um, I get to see some of it, but not all of it. So it's we have to be cautious about how much we invest in putting in and uh, charging bays around the town because it's the idea for the car industry is that you will go out in your car and you won't need to stop off to charge it up. There'll be a, there should be more than enough charge to get you there, get you home. And it's like um, how we use petrol stations now. We only use them when we need them, not because we have to. So thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, well, thanks very much, Matt, um, and and Steve for your for your for your for your your, your, uh, your words on that. I think uh, it, it's not going to go away from my point of view on scrutiny. So I, I certainly will invite you back at some point in the future with with further further updates. I'm sure. But, uh, th th thanks very much for your for your time, and uh, you're free to leave, Matt. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> okay, so we're on to item nine, which is the petition to stop the netting of hedges in Tamworth. Um, members may uh, may remember this is this is was something that was uh, that was brought to full council via a, a petition. Um, and at full council, it was uh, it was dealt with by um, referring it to scrutiny to to look at. Um, 
I think it was back in March. Yeah. So um, I'm going to hand it straight over to Anna to uh, give us the report. We've, we've obviously already had the report, but to, just to take us through it um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see where that leads. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. So, so yes, um, petition submitted in March, it had 4,600 signatures, essentially um, asking for the, to stop the netting of hedgerows um, by developers in Tamworth. So, it, yes, it went to full council. A number of points uh, were in the minutes. One was that it came back to, came to this particular scrutiny committee with a view that this committee will write a report that goes back to cabinet later in the year and before the sort of breeding season so that if there is anything that we can do, we're catching it before the issue cycles round into next year. That was, that was a really key sort of time timeline, if you like. Um, but in particular, um, full council referred to the national planning policy framework and also uh, new environmental legislation currently before the Commons, which actually I've reflected in the report is the Environment Act uh, 2021. So it's not in front of the Commons, it's actually enacted. So it's part of our statutory legislation. So I just thought, um, so at the bottom of the page, I just thought I'd set out what the issue is before then going on to kind of explain the legislation around it. So the issue of netting hedges um, came to the forefront in 2019. A number of national newspapers and, and TV, lots of media picked up that suddenly developers were, were netting hedges and, and not just for a week or for two weeks, but it was for a year or two years. It was a, for a substantial amount of time. And they were very, very visible um, because they would, um, if it was a hedgerow, they would they would cover it and it could be quite a large hedgerow or trees and it would it would cover the, the canopy of the trees. It was incredibly visible. So it suddenly came to the fore and it, it went across the media. Um, so, so that's why it suddenly became an issue. Um, and there was a petition that went to government with um, hundreds of thousands of people asking exactly the same question that was asked of this petition is to stop the netting of hedges. So there was a hearing very, very quickly. When that petition went in, the government had a hearing almost within weeks of the issue, almost exploding onto into everyone's sort of front rooms. Um, and they had a hearing about this, this very thing. So essentially, um, the, it's the Wildlife and Countryside Act um, dated 1981, which I'll go into in a second. But that's why developers have been using nets to cover hedgerows and trees. Um, they cover them with netting around the sites um, before any bird nesting activity begins. So because and I'll come on to why in the Wildlife and Countryside Act, I, Countryside Act, it could stop or restrict building during the summer months. So essentially they're mitigating their risk of essentially making a criminal act against that, the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So under that act, it's an offence under Section 1 to intentionally take, damage, destroy the nest of any wild bird, bird while it's in use or being built or to intentionally kill, injure, or take chicks or adults, or to intentionally take or destroy any eggs, anything to do with wild birds, therefore, in that breeding, nesting activity is, is protected in law. So within that act, there are, there are actually no dates uh, legally stated between which hedges cannot be trimmed, cut, laid, or coppiced. However, the main bird breeding season is recognised as being between the 1st of March and the 31st of August ish. Um, so the risk of committing any of the of the offences, as I've just set out, is increased between those dates. So if you're going to undertake any work on a tree or hedge, it might not be a developer, it could be your, yourself in your back garden. Um, if you're going to do it between those dates, it's recommended that you check for signs first for wild bird activity, for breeding, for nests, etc. And you should observe from a distance using binoculars and also direct like a fingertip search of the hedge or tree to check that there is no wild bird residing within that particular habitat. So if a developer who's removing a hedge or tree as part of a planning consent, um, they net it so that they don't undertake works essentially illegally um, should wild birds be present. So therefore, it's essentially mitigation for the developer 
so that they don't fall foul of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. So um, just as a just sort of moving on, if you do suspect that an offence has been committed, um, the local police force, so Staffordshire Police, they do have a wildlife officer who can get involved. And we have actually got them involved in some of the sites in Tamworth. They've been quite active in that respect. Um, and you, you get a crime number like you would with any particular criminal offence that might happen. So it's treated with the same sort of level of respect as anything else. It's really important. So Natural England, who sort of set out really um, what you might expect from a wildlife perspective, um, they, their approach is um, they would rather developers take a proportionate approach to netting. So, you know, rather than netting a hedge for three years, think about it, do it for something that's a bit more proportionate to what you're trying to achieve. Um, but they, they've, they've never come out and said, don't do it because actually the legislation doesn't exist for them to 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 say it. So it, for them, it's more about um, guidance around the mesh size, so that other wildlife isn't being trapped in there, or if if they are, they can escape quite easily, etc. Um, and they do themselves recognise that netting hedges does have a role to play at times within the the development um, in in a. With, with the development of a particular site. So even Natural England, who you might think would be diametrically opposed, um, have actually acknowledged that mitigation is sometimes an appropriate thing for developers to achieve um, for the sake of protecting wild birds. So just moving on in the report, I've just set out briefly that we do have a, a national wildlife crime unit nationally who um, are really important in investigating um, you know, quite serious sort of organised wildlife crime, but they do also provide an advisory service to the local police forces for issues such as this. So there's, there's a role there to play. I just wanted to demonstrate that they do have a national voice along with some of these others like developers. Um, etc. So moving on to the Environment Act 2021, so very, very new legislation. But the, the bit that's really key is part six, um, which deals with um, nature and biodiversity. Um, sorry to say, but paragraph 98, with specific reference to Schedule 14, um, makes provision for biodiversity gain to be a condition of planning permission in England. This is quite a new thing actually coming through the Act. Um, and it was a direct consequence of the petition that went to government in 2019. Um, the response from government was to kind of say to developers, one, think about what you're doing with respect to nets and be proportionate but two that biodiversity net gain would now become um, something that was required through the planning process so the environment act essentially puts that into legislation and so um, we we are now required to have a 10 percent biodiversity net gain um, which needs to be maintained for a period of at least 30 years um, that has to be part of planning applications. Um, it's about having a green future and it's um, part of the sort of conservative strategy which is a 25 year plan to improve the environment. When you have an application it's got to be better at the end of it than it was before you started it is essentially, is essentially the, the idea of it. So that has now cascaded down into the National Planning Policy Framework, also was amended in 2021 and picked up the Environment Act. And so it now also says it, 10% biodiversity net gain, which we do as an authority do. Not all applications qualify. Um, if you're going to change your windows on your house, we wouldn't expect you to have a biodiversity net gain. But um, for a large um, application, we would expect it. Um, and we always refer applications to uh, Staffordshire, um, the county council ecologist, um, who always supports us in deciding if it's possible and what they can and can't do to achieve that 10 percent 10 percent is actually quite a lot when you think of a large housing site um, on a small site um, you know it might just be planting a tree is 10 percent better you know that's very achievable but when you've got a large site it's actually very challenging and i think 
where it where it goes back to netting is that developers now have a responsibility perhaps to think a little bit more about what they're doing to perhaps retain some of these habitats because actually retaining is easier than then finding even more than 10%, which is what they have to do if they remove them at the start. So I think that's the plan from the government is, um, whilst there's nothing about netting in the Environment Act or in the National Planning Policy Framework, actually there is this biodiversity net gain which is going to be beneficial all round. So in conclusion, while birds are protected by law and disturbing them and their habitats, is a criminal offence. However, there is no specific um, regulation of the use of netting and it, it doesn't require planning permission to do it either. Um, so to try and be positive around this, because I know you've got to report it onwards, um, I did put in the appendix um, just something that Shropshire Council did, which was um, like an information page on their website, which I thought was quite good setting it out quite clearly what you can and can't do and, and go to the wildlife crime officer because actually that's a good person to go and speak to. Um, and also Shropshire um, put informatives on the bottom of their planning decisions. So an informative is, is different to a condition. A condition can be enforceable, but an informative is more of an advisory. So it's just making the developer aware that they have a requirement under the Wildlife and Countryside Act to protect wild birds. Again, it's nothing to do with stopping netting because actually we can't we can't stop that practice but it is an advisory to make sure that they uh, understand their um, uh, what they should be doing under that particular wildlife act so I've just I've just given a few suggestions um, but I have to say that in re researching around this to, to be able to write this paper I found very little information from local planning authorities or local authorities more generally on this issue. Um, Shropshire, back in 2019, when it all sort of exploded, uh, did something a bit proactive, but I haven't been able to find a lot else that's, that's very quickly and visibly obvious. So I'm happy to take, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, thanks Anna. And, uh, and, th and thanks very much for that comprehensive report, actually. It's, uh, it seems a highly technical report and uh, certainly it's took a, a lot of reading and, 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 and getting my head round and I'm not sure it's it's fully there yet actually. Um, but I'll just open up to questions and comments from other members of committee. John? Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, Anna, that was a smashing report. Thank you so much. Very comprehensive and... Uh, very, uh, very thought provoking. Um, on the way here this evening, I came along Coton Lane, which perhaps is the most obvious example of where this has all gone very wrong. Probably, I mean, I don't know if everyone knows Coton Lane, but uh, it was uh, I built a new housing estate on the uh, on the edge of the town. And in doing so, they've ripped up probably two thirds of the, the hedgerow, long, long established hedgerow. Goes back longer than me, shows you how old it is. Um, I can remember it as a boy. But there must be thousands and thousands of birds that have been deprived of home, not to mention all the, the other animals, hedgehogs and all sorts of things. It's had a major I think, catastrophic effect on nature in that particular area. And of course, all these hedgerows were netted for about a year and year and a half prior to the, um, the ripping up of the hedgerows. Why the builders had to rip up the hedgerows and not build their, uh, their, their houses um, in, in conjunction with them is beyond me, absolutely beyond me. But my point is, and my question is really, is there anything we can do to prevent developers from tearing up these invaluable uh, pieces of our natural environment? Um, how can we stop it? Thanks. If I can just, I, I, mean, I guess that's slightly outside the scope of the item, but, um, but Anna, if you could do, have a brief uh, answer to that, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure about a brief, but um, 
it's not unusual for some hedgerow loss or tree loss as part of an application. Um, so for a planning consent, let's say Coton Lane, for example. Um, generally speaking, when an application like that is um, submitted to the local planning authority for determination, it would go with it um, ecological surveys, et cetera, et cetera, or arboricultural surveys by someone who's uh, looked at all the trees and they've looked at the value of those particular habitats um, and they've come to a conclusion as to whether they, they could be lost or not. Sometimes hedgerows are lost not because they're in the way. They might actually prevent safe visibility for at junctions for example for traffic to turn in and out so sometimes you lose hedgerows for that reasons that reason sometimes trees um, are removed to make a better layout and it, and it always is a bit of a compromise as you know in planning you're weighing up different issues to arrive at something that's a, that's reasonable um, we quite often don't allow for hedgerows to be removed without there being replacement planting or something like that, or trees of a similar or better quality to be put back in. So it's never just removal. There's always a conversation to be held around doing something slightly different. The biodiversity net gain means that they have to do 10% on top of what's there at the start. Um, and I think that will actually make developers think twice about the resource that they have at the start of the process and whether they genuinely need to remove things to make for a better layout, et cetera. I think it's going to be harder for them to achieve it in future. Thanks, Anna and John Hope. That's, uh... Thanks, Anna. That's, I expected, that's really what I expected. Um, the netting of, um, of hedgerows to me is abhorrent. Uh, I'm sure to many people in this town, um, depriving uh, wild animals of their natural habitat is just not not anything that we, the government or any of us want to do in, in trying to improve our green environment um, and our natural environment. And it goes against every, every uh, tacit of that, of that. So I think, um, as a council, we need to try in our own way, as um, Shrewsbury has done, to discourage discourage this activity. And if ever we see it um, coming across the horizon, do whatever we can to prevent it. Because um, there is nothing I can see positive about netting hedgerows. Um, it may stop the birds from going in, but it doesn't stop all the other animals and uh, creatures that... that but find a home there. All we do is evict them. And uh, as, a, as an authority, I think we should be looking at stopping this activity whenever, ever we can. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Sheree. Yes, thank you. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it, this evening? We've been talking about charging, uh, being green in that way, having charging points for, for electric cars. Um, and this is just another example of how we really need to be green and we need to be looking after our environment. Um, so I, I concur with a lot of what uh, Councillor Harper said. Um, I was interested reading this uh, bit from Shropshire Council saying, normally we don't put a condition on planning decisions regarding nesting birds as they have legal protection. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we could put conditions on, uh, put planning conditions on. For example, um, we could put a condition on saying that netting was only permitted between that month and that month, rather than the netting being left in place for years and years. Uh, is, is that correct? Is my understanding correct that we could impose conditions regarding netting? I, I can honestly say I've, I've never seen one. And that that's that's my that's my honest answer. That doesn't mean perhaps we couldn't. Well, I think we'd have to take some legal advice over whether, given that they can do it without it being regulated in any way, whether we can actually regulate it. I, I'm, I'm I would be unclear on that. So I could take some advice, but I ha I've never seen it. I'll be honest. 
Thank you for that. As you know, my profession is the legal profession and we like things that are novel. You know, um, every, every sort of rule of law that we have in the country comes about because somebody made a novel decision and we've never done it before, but we're going to do it now. So I think it would be appreciated if we could look into that. Um, and also, um, I mean, it's, it's not... It's not just birds, it's things like, as, as John mentioned, hedgehogs. There's a big movement at the moment to have hedgehog highways. Um, and we should be thinking about that when we're considering planning. I wonder also whether there's, and I'm sure it is covered in training for councillors who are on the planning committee, but whether we could perhaps think about a bit more emphasis on um, biodiversity and, and the green environment when we're training people about making those planning decisions because I think that that's really important um, it, it's one of those things you don't know what you don't know um, and it might not occur to you if you haven't had that training that this is an issue that really needs to be considered very carefully on each application so yeah, thank you Th thanks Sheree um, yeah I was I was going to suggest that uh, obviously we we the committee has to report back or I have to report back on behalf of committee to to um to council later on in the year on this item and uh, I think Anna's report has really given us a basis for for some considerations but I think I think as you've you've said Sheree I think there's there's a number of questions there that you've asked that I think would be would really we we need to understand the implications or the answers before we can continue to to report back in so i think that would be really helpful Anna, if you could uh, do, do a little bit of digging there thank you just to clarify i've got um whether you can condition the timing of netting specifically yeah i, th I think that's a really interesting question because uh, most of these sort of say large housing sites would have an ecology report sort of attached to it which would normally set out mitigation so if you were uh, building a house close to a tree you'd have root protection zones and things like that so setting out the mitigation um, to avoid damage to habitats um, it's different it's different in this case because these are hedgerows that are coming out that's why they're netted so yeah just, just to come back on that, I appreciate that there are hedgerows that are coming out. We really ought to be asking the question why, um, because I'd, I'd probably be in Councillor Harper's camp of we shouldn't be removing hedgerows at all. And I appreciate that there might be reasons that developers want to remove them. And in very limited circumstances, there might be good reasons such as visibility splay at junctions and so on. But quite often... If we're honest, it's because it doesn't really fit their plans um, and they've got some some other idea. And whilst I appreciate that um, a hedgerow might be replaced by other planting, etc. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why rip out something that's been there for years and is perfectly ecologically sound for um, something else that might not be as good? Thanks, Sheree. I think... Again, I, th I think it is slightly outside the scope of this this item. It's it, it's verging it's verging on 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 just drifting away from from the art. But it's a valid point. It's a valid point. Um, if I may, chair, four thousand six hundred people signed the petition. Is that correct? Yeah, and it was about netting hedges. Yeah. So I'm not really sure in what way we're drifting away from the point. We're talking about netting hedges. And we've, and we've got 4,600 unhappy residents that we, we need to do something about. Because I think the point was about whether we're removing the hedges based on whether we need to be removing the hedges for that, um, that land that's being built on. So that's different to netting hedges. That was the point I was trying to, trying to make. But um, I think I think Anna, if you if you can find out the implications or any any if there has 
if it's ever been done before or whether it can be done, I think that would be that would be helpful. Thank you. Paul. I thought you were trying to get That's it. That's okay, Paul. Yeah, Any other questions or comments? No? Okay. Um, well, I say th thanks, Anna, for the report. I think we, we need to find that information out. And I think certainly for me, I, I, I need to take in, in the report and perhaps we'll feed back any other questions that I would hope committee can as well before perhaps our next meeting and, and then I'll... Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I need need to get you to present anything else, but uh, might might send you some questions by email. If if you want me to just do, you know, a paragraph that I can give to you for your next committee or whenever, um, for you to read out okay. on what I've found or not, um, then yeah, happy happy to do it. That, that that'd be great. Or if you if you if just email email it through, and I can I can let committee know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank, thanks very much, and you're 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 welcome to uh, to leave now. Thank, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Anna. Okay. So item ten is the forward plan. Um, hope everybody's had a chance to have a look. I'm not sure there's anything else uh, on there that uh, we've got the local plan um, that that's on the forward plan that we've we're obviously going to uh, look at on the. 23rd of August um, and there's uh, there's also a statement of community involvement and local development scheme I, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether that is something that it is probably something that we we can perhaps look at at that same meeting so potentially um, I don't know if anybody's seen anything else on there that, that we need to look but I think that's that is pretty much it for that's relevant to our committee um, item 11 is a working group updates. So, um, when was the facilities for HGV drivers? I think Ben was looking at with Sarah. With Sarah. Yeah. Um, I've not heard anything from Ben. I don't know if anything's been done on that at all yet. But, uh, um, and then the other item that we were looking to have um, uh, some sort of session on was uh, on, on travellers. Now, I, I, it's my understanding that, that Staffordshire County Council are doing some sort of work on this, and I'm currently sort of liaising with, the, with our portfolio holder, Martin Summers, to try and get some contacts there, because I don't, I've, I don't feel we should be duplicating some, some of the work that they're doing. It's something that we can, uh, we can use as a basis to perhaps do some some local scrutiny on um, and I think that's perhaps the the right approach if uh, if, if committee members think 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 that's a good approach so I'll, I'll wait and see see what comes of that sure yeah agree uh, it's good not to duplicate effort but I think we have got a pressing problem so it's just something we need to try to get some answers on quite okay. soon yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. And it's, um, I just don't want to rush into doing something that perhaps has some wider implications and we uh, say we end up duplicating. So I think I'd rather wait to see what we get from, from that Staffordshire wide uh, review. Uh, and then we can look at what's perhaps more specific to, to our borough and area. Um, Okay, so item 12 is our work plan. Um, happy to go through it, but I think at the moment we're, we, we've, we've, we've not got that much opportunity for putting, putting extra items in there um, other than ones that will come up through the forward plan. Um, we've obviously got our next meeting will now be in August and we've got, got the items uh, for that. So... Um, unless anybody's got any other comments on work plan. Andy. Thanks, Chair. Um, the one thing that I was fairly passionate about adding to the work plan was the, uh, obviously the, the two buildings over there. I think, sorry, move your mic. Um, I think they fit 
well uh, within this um, this this sphere of influence, um, with it being infrastructure, safety, and growth. Um, it's part of the future high street fund. Um, it's safety because of the, uh, the 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 reported state of the buildings and um, its infrastructure. Um, is it is it on? Sorry, it's it is is actually on. It is actually on the work plan. We just haven't got a date on there yet. Right. Okay. So, uh, okay. And the, the other thing was um, with the. Uh, um, a work plan to do with transport um, integration, uh, particularly with um, the, the buses, the bus issue that was that was reported with them idling, but more looking at it from a larger scale to see how we can better um, integrate the, the, the bus service in Tamworth um, with the, the railway service and, 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 and other services as well. That's what I'd, I'd Okay, so, I'd like, so like a, a local, local travel or... Yeah. Public yeah, transport, yeah. absolutely. Or you know, uh, not necessarily public transport, but transport available to the public. Let's let's say, Richard. Chair, I'm happy to lead a working group on that one to uh, d d define the scope of okay. our, our work program uh, item. Uh, Councillor Turner raised something with me uh, earlier, uh, so I'm sure he'd very much like to be a part of it. Um, we'll always invite a member of the opposition if, if um, Cherie or Sarah wants to be on it. And I think Councillor Cooper kind of indicated as he raised it. So if it's with, okay with you, Chair, us four get together and bash out come kind of uh, uh, the scope of the whole integrated transport policy that we can bring back to the committee at some point. Excellent. Crack, crack on is what I would <laughs> is what I would say. And uh, and and there's never an opposition on 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 <laughs> on, on our side scrutiny. We're all on the same team. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, you can speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one thing I did want to mention. I got the um, the date of the, the the minutes of the last meeting. So it, it was the meeting for the fourteenth of June that Still we. Uh, to be okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay, I just I just I read them read them as the the wrong date. So uh, excuse me for that. So okay. Uh, I think our. Uh, our work is done tonight. It's, uh, I think, 28 minutes past seven. So I'm going to close the meeting. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Thank you.